Welcome to Doxadeo City Changers.
done And I'll remember how far you've carried me From beginning until the end You are faithful, faithful spun creations his pride and adoration treasures woven by his love his careful as they hold us safe within his promise of calling and of destiny come let's sing it again where heaven spun creations his pride and adoration, treasures woven by His love. His careful as they hold us, saved within His promise of calling and of destiny. And I will sing of all You've done. How far you've carried me from beginning until the end. You are faithful, faithful to the end. The Father's up and for me, a never-ending story of love that's always chasing. Kindness overwhelming and hope for me unending is never given up on me. And I will sing of all you've done, and I'll remember how far you've carried me from the You let me fall, you know. 
Give us this day our daily bread. This is the next thought that Jesus introduces when his disciples ask him, Jesus, teach us to pray. And Jesus responds and says, in this manner then, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, reveal yourself. Thy kingdom come, thy rule be made visible, your identity be linked into our hearts and our lives. Let it be done on earth through us as it is already being done in heaven. Give us our daily bread. Jesus wanted us to know that it's important to ask for natural provision. We see multiple examples of that in scripture. James chapter 5 says, if any one of you is suffering, let him pray. If anyone is cheerful, let him sing psalms. If anyone is sick, let him call the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. We see the same idea in 3 John chapter 1 verse 2 where he says, Beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health just as your soul prospers. There's something about asking God for our natural provision. Sometimes we think it's selfish. God says, ask. I want you to ask me for this. For me personally, probably one of the strongest scriptures in this regard is Philippians chapter 4. It says, be anxious for nothing. So beautiful that your soul will prosper. Be anxious for nothing. But in everything, with prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. A Jewish audience in front of him, Jesus introduces this thought of how we should pray by using two distinct words in that little phrase. He didn't just say, give us this day our bread or give our daily bread. He specifically prayed and said, give us this day our daily bread. And he uses two, two words, day and daily, which immediately would have echoed in the hearts and the minds of the Jewish people back to Israel when they were in the, in the desert. And we read in Exodus chapter 16 when the Lord says to Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a certain quota every day that I may test them whether they will walk in my law or not. And it shall be on the sixth day, there you have that word day, that they shall prepare what they bring in, and it shall be twice as much as they gather daily. Day and daily. It was as if God wanted to take them back to that moment where Israel found themselves in the desert without any provision. There were no resources. They could not go back to Egypt. 
They had no means of taking the promised land. There was confusion and, 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 and doubt amongst the people. And here they're stuck without food and natural resource. And God says, I will provide every day for you what you need daily. I think if I speak to some people, they'd rather be praying, Lord, give us our annual bread rather than give us our daily bread. I find something in that quite compelling. It's as if God said, I want you to every day, not just in a season or over a period of a year, perhaps. I want you to every day know that I am your source, even if it is for your natural provision. You know, our dependence is on him. And this he makes very clear in Exodus 16, just a few verses later in the same chapter when he says, so it was that quails came up in the evening and covered the camp and, and in the morning dew lay all around the camp. And, 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 and when the layer of dew lifted there on the surface of the wilderness was a small round substance as fine as frost on the ground. So when the children of Israel saw it, they said to one another, what is it? For they did not know what it is. And so Moses said to him, this is the bread that the Lord had given you to eat. Now, hang on a bit, Moses. This is not bread. This is a small seed. We're not actually quite sure what it is. And then Moses goes on to say, this is the thing which the Lord has commanded. Gather it every day according to everyone's needs. One omer for every person and let every man take for those who are in his tent. It was as if God says, I am giving you provision in a seed form. I find that profound. It was Keith Green in, in the 80s. I, I remember as a schoolboy growing up listening to some of his cassette tapes. And, and one of the songs that he had was about the manna. It was, you know, the Hebrew word manna means what is it? Exactly what the Israelites were saying. What, what is this manna, manna, manna? But I remember Keith's Green song, uh, Keith Green's song saying, you know, one day they made manna burgers. And the next day they made manna pizzas. And the next day they made manna and bolognese. There was something about the fact that they still had to work with us. And, and so often I think we forget that God provides for us in a way, not that we find the full expression of that, but God provides for us in a seed form that we gather and collect. And then we have the responsibility to work with that provision. To take that provision until it becomes bread to our lives. John Wesley said, asking God to give us our daily bread should not encourage us to stand around waiting for it all to fall down from heaven. And I think this is something that is echoed in the way Jesus teaches us to pray because I think there are two traps we can fall into in this in this understanding firstly we can fall into the understanding of um, a prosperity gospel you know God is going to supply absolutely everything I want in the way that I want it you know name it claim it frame it grab it flab it touch it or on the other hand, we have this idea of a, pro, uh, of a poverty gospel, you know, that leaves us with a sense of lack, leaves us with a sense of brokenness. And I believe that none of these reflect the true gospel. I do, however, believe that we serve a God who serves us with provision, not poverty or prosperity, but with provision. God sees ahead what we need. And it's from that understanding that we can pray, give us our daily bread. Let's just pause there for a moment if we can. Because here Jesus reflects this little phrase again, us. Our Father, give us our daily bread. I see so much in scripture about praying for one another. And praying for the needs of others. Can I give you a few examples? Romans 1. For God is my witness whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his son. That without ceasing I make mention of you always in my prayers. Without ceasing. 
2 Corinthians, for we are glad when we are weak and you are strong. And this we also pray that you may be made complete. Ephesians, um, uh, Philippians chapter 1, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you. Always in every prayer of mine making requests for you all with joy. Second Thessalonians, therefore we also pray always for you that God would count you worthy of this calling and fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness and work in you with his faith and his power. We see this saturated in the New Testament, the New Testament church praying for one another. And whilst it's good for us to pray for natural provision, what I never see in scripture that they pray over one another is I never see them praying for somebody else's business. I never see them praying for job promotions or a better house or better living circumstances. They're always praying for wisdom, for calling, for knowledge and for discernment. I think there's something in this for us to learn. When I sometimes frequent our life groups, I'm confronted with prayer request lists that I'm not always quite sure if they accurately reflect a biblical model of what we should be praying for. And so that... Scripture introduces this idea, Jesus introduces this idea of the fact that bread is not really just our natural provision, but bread is also spiritual provision. And time's not really going to allow me to go into this in depth, but allow me just to, to refresh our memories on John chapter 6, verse 31 to 35, where, where Jesus introduces this thought. He says, our fathers ate manna in the desert. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. We just read that a few minutes ago. And then Jesus says, most assuredly, <laughs> I love that. So, so much conviction. Most assuredly, I'm not even doubting this. Let me say to you, Moses did not give them bread from heaven but my father gives you the true bread from heaven for the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world and then they said to him Lord give us this bread always and Jesus said to them I am the bread of life I am the manna that has come down from heaven to bring you life and he who comes to me shall never hunger and he who believes in me shall never thirst it was as if in this moment Jesus was repositioning himself in the center of everything that we would experience as lack or broken or unprovided for or things that we needed or things that we that we yearn for it was as if Jesus was placing himself in the center of this saying listen if you ever prayed the prayer give us this day our daily bread may you discover that the bread of heaven is already present wow I cannot, I cannot tell you how this has started to challenge my own personal life, my own personal prayers. That I would think of provision as something out there as if it was still to come, whereas provision was already present. Jesus makes this comment and he says, listen, Man shall not just live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. It was as if Jesus was saying that this provision is not just the bread of life. It's not just Christ present, but it is Christ present with every word, every opinion opinion that filters through the mouth of God and so when I'm praying for the provision of God what I'm praying for in essence is to discover Christ 
present in that situation already. More importantly, to discover what is he saying. It's no wonder that James picks up on this in the first chapter of his letter that he writes. When he says, brothers and sisters, count it all joy when you're going through all kinds of trials and tribulations because you will discover in yourself that you will lack nothing you know would it be okay if we prayed for natural provision would it be okay if you were a business person listening to this video and 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 you thought well i need to pray for my business yanni i i need to figure this out i need to I need to figure out how this is working. Would it be okay for me to pray for my business that, that I would have more customers and that, you know, that we would make ends meet financially? Would it be okay to do that? The answer to that is yes. But can I, can I, can I encourage you this morning? Can I encourage you today that you discover not just, you know, Christ is your provision in more customers, but that you would cr discover Christ is present in that business. Because what if the provision was not just more customers? What if the provision of God was a word from God that gave you direction and clarity and purpose for that business in a way that you'd never discovered? And one of the byproducts of that was more customers. That makes sense. You see, it was as if Jesus was preempting a moment that was to come just a short while from there. We'd, he would be hanging on the cross, crying out, it is finished. By implication, it was as if Jesus was saying, never again would you have to pray for provision. Because in me, you have found every sense of provision there could ever be if you're listening to this thinking you know i i just need to balance the credit card and i i need you know i i've got somebody in my family who's sick and that and this just all sounds like a bit of christianese to me you know what and it does even as i'm speaking this I suppose in some other shape or form it does Christ is all that you'll ever need. But if we could grasp the reality of that in our prayers, in our divine conversations, there would never be anything else that we would need. Give us this day our daily bread. He already has. He is our daily bread bread. Hello and welcome again to a wonderful time where we're going to discuss the life of a young man who's changing the city around him. And um, it's great to hear the dreams of people realizing in a fantastic way. Duval, welcome. It's great to have you here. Um, I'm excited to hear your story and what God is doing in your life. Maybe just tell us, we don't know each other really well, who is Duval and what are you doing at the moment? Hello, Tofs. It's really great to be here. Thanks for the opportunity. So, um, yeah, I'm from Toria, was born and bred here. Um, I come from Toria North. And, um, yeah, so five or six years back, gave my life to God and um, had a massive turnaround. And, um, yeah, so a few years ago, um, two years ago, I, I made the decision to go into ministry. So at the moment, I'm a youth pastor at Doxa Day of Brooklyn and uh, a life coach as well. And um, yeah, really, Fantastic. really um, have a passion for corporate culture, leadership, and raising city changes. Mm, wonderful. Yes. And of all, you've um, found yourself in an in a environment that God is using in a profound way. Maybe tell us what happened um, at the school where you were asked to get involved, um, because I think that is just an inspiring story. Yes, so I have a friend that is a youth worker at Pretoria Nord Work School, and um, I was um, preaching there, helping him with the, with the spiritual aspect of the school. And um, there came an opportunity um, where, they, where we needed to, um, I, I got an opportunity to consult the rugby team. Okay. They, were, they, they had a few issues. The guys who didn't um, get first team were going to play other sports and everything. So we started um, investing in the rugby program. 
And um, I initially had to consult only a few sessions, but when talking to the sport coordinator at the school, we, we started really going on a journey and um, investing uh, very deeply in the, in the sport program. And we have a dream to completely um, uh, have a do-over of this, the sport culture at the school and really bring in a godly system, a values-based system that can change people's lives and the community. But what kind of things would you do? I mean, these are our high school kids. Yes. They've got different realities. Uh, they all want to play sport and be successful, but uh, obviously they bring with them the personalities and yes. uh, their household situation and stuff, and they're all put together. Yes. Sometimes, I mean, I'm listening to this and I'm thinking, I wouldn't even know where to start. What yes. kind of things do you invest into the lives of those boys? So I must say, at, at first, we also didn't know where to start. Um, we were really led by God about how to go about this. So we started with, um, with, a life, with, with some life coaching tools that I, I, um, I taught the, the players. And from there, God just came in and, and gave, us, gave us a path. So um, the one exercise we did with the boys was um, we, uh, we, we had a purpose exercise. So we had one-on-ones with everyone. And a big thing that came out is everyone played rugby because it's fun. Mm. So I asked the question, what happens if we start losing? Is it still fun? And all of them said, no, it's not fun anymore. Mm. So that's not something that will drive you to greatness. Mm. And um, we, we worked with their purpose. We found out what they want to um, do with their rugby, what they want to, um, to be someday. Um, most of them said they want to um, play for provincial sides, go overseas. Big dreams, and big desires. Big dreams, big yeah. desires. Mm. Um, and maybe it can, it can be an a, a avenue for them to go and study. Mm. So, um, yeah, once we did that purpose exercise, these guys went into overdrive. And we had an off-season program that was amazing. Amazing how? Yes. So the boys started, we've got a gym there. They climbed into that gym mm. and really became mean oh, really? in that uh, in that time so yeah it was it's, really great it's great to hear the well because yes. i think many schools invest and would call it invest into their sport mm -hmm. into the first team rugby i mean that is the yes. icon of the school yeah and most of the time you hear of hard work discipline yes. exercise yeah uh, some strategy but it's hard work and unity yes. but this is a complete different side of who they are as people yeah. that you addressed. Yes. What did you see change more than a normal school tackled better, better scrums, better mm -hmm. uh, goals and, and, line, and line outs? How did you see change in the program yeah. as a fruit of what you were investing in? I think, I think just, I need, just need to say this, that, that we've got a, a, a different approach from normal rugby sites. So mm -hmm. we, we invest in, in, in three areas, okay. and that's the spirit, the soul, and the body. So it's not just we get the guys fit mm. and teach them how to play rugby. We also have a strong uh, spiritual side to our team. And I think that's made all the difference. Um, we've got a great technical staff, um, great coaches. I've got a great team working with me. Mm. And um, we, we were such a great team just to address all these um, aspects of, of what a human is. Mm. So that, that made all the difference okay. at the end of but the day. A, a school rugby team that has a lot of good rugby playing to the changes in the guys. Yes. What effect did it have on them personally as a result of spirit, soul and body that was invested into? I could really just see a massive change in, in how they were doing things, how they were approaching life. Mm -hmm. um, they really, as I said, they became men of character. They became men of integrity. Mm -hmm. um, and in, there was just so many indicators. Um, we went on a tour recently. And these guys were so disciplined. They were, they were really stand-up guys, and mm. they which they, wasn't normally the case. No, 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 not at all. So for previous years there were a lot of issues when we would go on to a, um, and this year really it was it was such a great experience just to see the guys mm. um, taking responsibility for their own life, taking responsibility for, for their actions, mm. and um, yeah, just just to say this, we've got um, what, we've got one player that. Last year, um, got a red card because he fought on the field. From your school? Yes, yeah. from our school. So okay. he was under 16 then, so he's first team now. And uh, one of the games we played now, a guy pushed him, and he actually went 
I'm sorry. Oh, really? Yes. It's changing character already. Uh, great, huh? great, great changing character. But those things cost us in the rugby because um, that discipline cost us. If you, you get points against you if you, if you, if you get a red card or mm. if you get a yellow card. So, mm. as I said, the discipline has really um, went to, to it's, it's gone to new levels. Yeah. The other thing is um, what I think happened is that the boys started taking initiative. All the players are taking initiative in the team, which was a big problem. Um, they're going out now. They started their own prayer group. They started their own um, like little cell group where they meet before games. They meet mm. before um, training sessions. And they discuss the word. They discuss, um, they discuss life. Which is important yes. because otherwise they find identity in sport yes. and not in yeah. who they are in Christ. Eh? Yes. So I think that's the major thing is we, we taught them the identity in Christ. Mm. And there was... A, we're still busy with this, but the whole shift of, of your paradigm of what winning is. Mm. Um, so Being we are, a winner and not yes, winning at times. Yes. Yeah. Mm. So we play to glorify God. And that's at the end of the day what, what we want to do. We want to um, get, in, uh, get a chance to glorify God through our rugby. Mm. Um, and if that is on the field, we, we need to show sportsmanship off the field just to live out the values that we have in the team. Mm. Um, How did the school awesome. respond to that during games? I mean, is there, uh, does it have an impact wider than only the team? Yes, so we went on a camp, uh, a character camp, where we, we pushed the guys a bit to grow. Mm. And we were busy with a, a, a name for the team. We gave it absolutely over to the team that they had to decide what the, the name of the team gonna, is going to be. And um, eventually on that camp, we woke them up three o'clock one morning and we said, guys, we need a name. Mm. And they sat through the night and they discussed this and they got a name for the team. And um, yes, so they got the, uh, the Swart Leaves. Okay. And, um, Black Lions. Lions. The Black Lions. <laughs> yeah. And uh, when we play games, the whole, the whole pavilion is shouting Swart Leaves. Beautiful. So that's Support beautiful. Them, hey. yes, so yeah, that that's identity. Great. Yeah establishment yes. among them is already mm. spilling over to the kids. Definitely. The rest of them. And yeah. I, it, it was a difficult thing in the past where they wanted to change some, um, some traditions. Mm. It was very difficult. Mm. But I think with God's help um, we, and, and His anointing, of course. Um, we, we, we got it. And, and this is absolutely, it's, it's like a flame. Mm. Um, everyone just got lit with, with, with the Swart Liu's eh? name. Yeah. And then obviously you trust that the effect of this importation and investment into them will carry them through life, not only when they leave school, but that they will take it with them as young men. Yes, so we've got a motto that we don't only want to make great players, we want to make great men. Mm. Um, and after school, we, would, we want to, that's our, our aim is to hear stories of them succeeding in life, yeah. going into places where they, they can change the environment, in a workplace, uh, wherever they go, that they can go and make an impact. So we are equipping them to go out and, and, and change a city, change an environment wherever they go. Mm. So that's our whole um, take, motto. Take is, that flame with them. Hey? Yes, yeah, so take yeah. that flame with yeah, them. Beautiful. Take the roar with them. Yeah. The vol it's so inspiring because I think many people struggle with teenagers. Yes. And it's almost like it's a hopeless case. Leave them alone to grow up until they you know, get brains somewhere in their 20s and then they become humans again. Yes. Um, so I think it's awesome. And I want to honor God and honor you for yes. the work that you're doing. To see young boys really discover God and yes. what He called them to be mm. and the impact that you're having. Um, I yes. pray that God will accelerate that impact. Mm. I think that more schools and more people hearing this will be inspired. Yes. Uh, the, the school and the boys listening to mm. this program will be inspired to, yeah. to continue being that light. So mm. thank you for your time. May yes. God really bless you. Pleasure. May we hear more testimonies of what God is doing in our schools yes. and in the lives of these young men. So thank you for coming. Great. It was a pleasure being here. Cool stuff. Swart Lewis. <laughs> Can somebody please help me make sense of this world that I'm living in? Can somebody please help me understand? In my opinion, the only way that we can truly make sense of this world is living lives that can be characterized as lives lived in genuine, truthful Christianity. Seeing the world through God's eyes, understanding the world through his thoughts and then becoming his hands in this world. We are called into this world to try to understand God's thoughts in situations that we are exposed to. 
Isaiah 55 is just so clear in verses 8 to 9 where God says, My thoughts are not your thoughts. My ways are not your ways. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so my thoughts are higher than yours. My ways higher than yours. And then verse 13, the Lord says, if you get this, if you get that you need to, you ask for my understanding in situations that you are in. If you get this, then in the world around you, the thorn bush will make way for the juniper. The briar will make way for the, for the myrtle. All of this to the Lord's renown. We are called, if we want to be able to make sense of this world, to not be subject to inferior thoughts, to our thoughts in difficult situations. Those situations that we fear, those situations that we keep so far from God's heart. We are called to bring God's thoughts into those situations. It's as if the Lord is challenging us. He's saying, when you are in a situation that you are fearful of, a situation that you don't understand, I'm challenging you, says the Lord. Climb up the ladder into the heavens. Bring my thoughts then that I share with you down into your world, into your life, into your reality. It's similar to the vision that Jacob had when he was wrestling God in a desperate place, when he was so scared of going back to his family there at the river where he was struggling and fighting with God. The vision that God gave him were angels walking up into heaven, collecting God's thoughts, collecting God's realities, and then bringing them back into the world. God is challenging you today. That place that you don't understand, that place that you are fearful of, Get his mind, his thoughts on those, and you will be better able to navigate your reality. So that's very easy to say. And then real life happens. What happened with me a few weeks ago was that I was, I was held at gunpoint for the first time in my life. I was in my car on the way home, and standing at a traffic light at 20 past 6 in the afternoon, I thought I heard something in my, at my window. I thought somebody wanted to clear my, my, my windscreen and I said, no, thank you. And I was on the, on the telephone lines with my wife and my kids. All of a sudden, I just saw this gun pointed at my head and somebody screaming at me to open the window. I very quickly tried to open the window and in my, in my startle and my fear, I opened the back window that uh, I thought funny at the time, but uh, the person with the gun didn't think that's so funny. He started screaming at me, saying he's going to kill me, he's going to kill me, and he wants my watch, and he wants my ring, and he wants many different things. I opened the window, I gave him what he wanted, he left, the light turned green, and I drove off. Scary, scary place to be, and so many people that are listening to this have been exposed to that reality, and even worse. Driving home, I was challenged by the scripture in 2 Timothy 1 verse 7. God said, I didn't give you a spirit of fear. I gave you a spirit of, of passion, love, sound mind. God challenged me in that place on my way home in those 40 minutes to test what I was preaching, to test climbing into heaven, into heaven to collect his thoughts on this reality. I was, as I was driving home, I was just, I was thinking about the political situation. I was thinking about the crime statistics in South Africa. I was thinking about my family. My inferior thoughts, those scared thoughts, those fearful thoughts got me to a place where I said, I am scared. I need to protect my family. I need to get out. God intervened through His Spirit in an amazing way. And he came and he rested my heart and he said, I want to give you a different perspective to what happened here today. I want your, you to get my thoughts into your reality. When I got home, there was a, a little entourage waiting for me in the, in the living room. My kids wanted to know, Daddy, why? Why did this happen? I sat them down and I said, you know, I want to explain to you why this happened. South Africa, how many people, I asked them, live in South Africa? They didn't know, and I said, 57 million. If you want to know why it happened, though, 
It's not about the 57 million. And I asked my kids, do you know how many people of the 57 million are poor? They didn't know. The answer, 30 million. I asked them the question, how many people in South Africa live with less than 10 rand a day? The answer, 13.9 million people. I said to him, the reason why this happened is that there is such a big difference in South Africa between those that have and those that have not. I told them that the watch that they stole from me could feed a family in this country for a whole year. I said to them that maybe this guy that pointed the gun at my head, maybe, just maybe, he has a daughter of 12 and a son of 10 with no food and maybe he had no other choice than to make this stupid decision. My kids looked at me and they said, Daddy, we understand why. We understand why this happened. And you know, not for one second, not for one iota in that discussion, could I see fear in the eyes of my kids. You see, real life happens to us. It's in those real life situations that I want to challenge you today. Don't you want to, don't you want to think differently about those situations? Don't you want to spend time with your God, climb up into heaven, collect His thoughts and bring those down into your reality. I promise you, if you're able to do that with your God, your life will be different and fear will not be part of it. Romans 16 verse 20 says, and the God of peace will soon crush Satan. The God of peace not the God of the armies, not the God of the angel armies. The God of peace will soon crush Satan. God wants you to live a life that is without fear. That is only possible if you look at the world through His eyes, understand the world through His thoughts. May you have peace in your world and in your life. We ended in the previous session talking about motion, action. People love it when we know what the cause is and we can see the vision. We can see a clear picture of a preferred future that is so compelling that I'm willing to sacrifice for that. But that's not enough. People need good leaders to tell them where they are in relationship to that particular dream and then help me with goals, help me with the next steps that brings me into motion so that I sense I am moving towards achieving that particular goal. I am absolutely convinced that great leaders create motion. They create movement. Things change. Change is not always fun because people like to be in their comfort zones but good leadership is to help people to see that the change is worth the effort that the benefit of the change is bigger than the discomfort of the change maybe the sacrifice that comes along with the change and one of the tools that I've always used to create motion as a leader is what I would simply call a next step mentality, a next step mentality. Kenneth Blanchard put together a little booklet with a title, The One Minute Manager Meets the Monkey. And he spoke about this that I affectionately just call monkey business. It's a task oriented approach where I ask the question, what is the next step? Not what is the goal, what is the next step? in relationship to that particular goal. So it's breaking down big goals into easy steps. Great leaders know how to simplify the vision. I mean, if we look at some of the dreams that we have, Jesus said, go and make disciples of nations. How on earth do you tackle a mountain like that? Dr. Dao says we want to transform a whole city. How on earth do you tackle a huge giant like that? Maybe you have some 
causes that you stand for that is way too big for you to even comprehend how and, 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 and what we should do to be able to achieve that. So great leadership breaks it down. Even if you have great financial goals set out for yourself for the next year or five years, if you can break it down to a monthly, to a weekly, to a daily next step, you will find that life actually becomes achievable and it creates motion. The moment that people start moving in the direction of the goal, those small victories begin to create momentum and faith and a conviction that maybe we can actually achieve the impossible. It has been the fuel of motivation of individuals for thousands of years. So what I basically do in all of the relationships of the teams that I lead, we would say, all right, this is the cause, this is the goal that we're going for. And then we would break it down into a little simple next step. Let me make it quite simple. Let's, for instance, say you and I have an appointment. We want to set up a meeting to sit and plan for something. So what I would typically do is go to my secretary and we would sit down and just ask the question to achieve the goal of arranging a meeting with you. What is the next step? And we would basically just, just talk about it and say, all right, Trish, you are going to call or email this person. That is the next step. And then we ask the question, how high is the risk of that next step? Is it low enough that she could take it? If it's a high risk, meaning that if the relationship is maybe sensitive for some reason, then I'll tell her, no, I'll take the next step. It's a very simple understanding between us. And then if she knows that she can take the next step and the risk has been sorted out, she takes it and we just have a checkup time. So I tell her, all right, give me feedback by tomorrow, feedback by Friday, or whatever the case may be. These simple steps helps me to lead Trish in achieving the collective goal, the cause of having a meeting with you. Now let's take it to a much bigger example. You have to raise a million rand. Then you just ask the question, what is the next step? And if you've never done it before, the next step is research. And then you ask the question, do I need to do the research? Or do I have somebody that I can ask to do the research? It is a next step mentality that helps people to move in the direction of achieving their goals. If you want to raise a million bucks, let's start by raising a hundred bucks. And if you are able to achieve that, it gives you the faith to go to a thousand and maybe to 10,000. Those are little next steps that you take on your on your way to achieving the bigger goal. And it is just this repetitive process that creates motion so that in the end, people are motivated to achieve big things in the name of the cause that they stand for. One of the elements that always has an influence on your vision is, is resources. You always start at a point where you don't know where are the people going to come from who's going to do this? Where's the money going to come from? Uh, where are we going to get enough knowledge and wisdom? Where will we get strategy? So I have a problem-solving paradigm that I've been using for so many years now. And I want to encourage you to also look at the DVD set and the YouTube uh, uh, set that we put together about problem solving. Let me just give you a quick summary and then we'll continue. So it starts with a question, what do I really want? And then we ask the question, why do I want it? And from there we go to what are my options? And that helps me to define next steps. A leader, let me remind you, we're talking about this session is about a leader creates motion. And to create motion, I Constantly take people through this grid. What is it that you want? So I have a goal. I want to achieve this goal. Why is it important to me? Um, and then we get to the option column where we work through all of the possibilities so that we can know if it's a possibility 
that, for instance, I want to raise a thousand rand. One possibility is to just think about who the people are in society who would be willing to invest a thousand rand into this particular cause. If you want to sell a product, it's exactly the same thing. I want to sell a product. Why do I want to sell it? And what are the options to achieve that goal that I want to see happen? If I have options, then I can take next steps. So the next step, for instance, if I know that there are five people who have the capacity to give 5,000 rand towards this goal, maybe the goal is the raising and releasing of young leaders in society, the next step would simply be to contact them and to get the vision out to them and to ask them. Some of them are going to say no, and then we come back again and we redesign this whole process. I want to put this all together and say that I think the best leaders in society are able to break big goals down to small steps. And they are able to motivate people to begin to achieve that which they previously thought they could not do with the problem-solving grid of facilitating motion and next steps towards the big cause that we stand for. Mm -hmm.